I have been keeping an eye on the mileage of the average modern vehicle for quite some time, and I've noticed a slight decline after the mid to late 1990s. However, after the turn of the century, the mileage continued to get steadily and progressively worse. It's really sad when six cylinders consume nearly as much and need more fuel than a V8, and four cylinders that consume nearly as much and need more fuel than a six cylinder. I have even seen a small handful of four cylinder vehicles that had such an inefficient setup that they actually managed to get six cylinder city mileage and V8 mileage and even less on the highway. And when I looked at the mileage of these vehicles, at first I could not figure out what was wrong. I figured emission controls were choking up the engines that badly, but further research dispelled that theory. Then I figured that the vehicles kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier with all the safety devices that kept getting installed year after year. That wasn't the case either. In fact, a lot of vehicles actually shed weight, but the mileage still continued to drop. I couldn't figure it out. Then suddenly it dawned on me, gearing, high engine RPMs. That's how so many vehicles got such lousy mileage. Instead of horsepower, look at torque. Horsepower is the amount of work that's generated by an engine. Torque is the force of that work that you feel getting the vehicle off the line for faster acceleration and better performance. Larger engines tend to produce more torque and have a wider range of torque than smaller engines. So to make the smaller engine perform better, the most effective method is to use a combination of an increase in horsepower and higher gearing which increases the engine's RPMs at lower speeds to make up for the lower amount of torque from these downsized engines. The more you downsize an engine, the more you downsize the amount of torque that engine can produce. It's a cheaper performance alternative as opposed to building larger engines that actually provide more torque and power. While it may be the cheaper alternative, Unfortunately, it's also the devil's bargain for lower mileage. Now, it is true that a smaller engine will burn less fuel than a larger engine. It's the engine's sheer size. The engine in and of itself is the where that efficiency ends. It's the gearing and high RPMs that cause many of those smaller engines to become inefficient. In the 70s, when we had the gas crunch, the EPA pressured the automotive industry for improvements in mileage and emissions, which they did. So they got rid of the big block V8 muscle cars. They downsized many of the smaller V8 engines for more fuel efficient four cylinder and six cylinder engines, as well as using lower compression pistons and smaller carburetors. While mileage and emissions were greatly improved, performance was practically non-existent. However, in the 80s, with the introduction of fuel injection, performance and mileage were both on the uprise. In the early to mid 90s, once again, performance and mileage were both on the uprise. After the late 1990s, there was a slight decline, but there was a steep nosedive after the turn of the century that kept getting progressively worse. That's because more and more consumers continued to ask the automotive industry for improvements in acceleration and performance from these smaller engine vehicles, which they did. Unfortunately, instead of doing it the proper way by building a larger engine that actually provided more torque and power, they took the same existing engines and increased the horsepower a tiny bit, but there was still the issue of the lack of torque, so they slapped in higher gearing to make up for it. But anytime you choose that method for better performance, you're going to wind up burning a lot more fuel. But a lot of people don't understand how that happens. For the most part, the general public tends to understand relatively simple things. V8, 6-cylinder, 4-cylinder, 6-speed, 5-speed, 4-speed, front, rear, all-wheel drive. And when they look at a large vehicle and a small vehicle getting identical mileage, they tend to get confused. They get confused even more when they see an engine like a large V8 and a small V6 getting the same mileage. Then they get confused beyond that when they start counting the number of cylinders. You can't count the number of cylinders any longer. When engines were fitted with a carburetor, that was a different story. A carburetor is nothing more than a simple mechanical device that measures the amount of air and fuel mixture that flows through the carburetor's chambers. But with fuel injection and advanced combustion technology and computer controls, that's all changed. It's more leveled out. So to lessen the confusion, I'm going to skim through fuel induction systems. I'm also going to discuss front, rear, and all-drive platform layouts, basic engine information, gearing in the transmission, gearing in the differential, and the relationship that they share with mileage and performance.
fuel induction systems. There are five general types of fuel induction systems. There's the old-fashioned mechanical carburetor, throttle body fuel injection, tune port injection, multi-port fuel injection, and the newest, most efficient, direct fuel injection. All internal combustion engines draw the air-fuel mixture into the cylinders by forming a negative vacuum pressure created by the downward motion of the pistons. Many engines operate utilizing this technique. Those type of engines are referred to as being naturally aspirated, meaning the air-fuel mixture that is drawn into the cylinders is only from the vacuum pressure created by the suction of the downward travel of the pistons. Some engines, however, employ a technique called force induction, which displaces extra air-fuel mixture into the cylinders by using superchargers, which are driven by the engine's belt accessory drive, or turbos, which rely on the engine's exhaust temperature and pressure. Vehicle Drive Platform Layouts this is the front wheel drive platform. Power goes from the engine, to the transmission, to the transaxle, and then to the wheels. This is the rear wheel drive platform. Power goes from the engine, to the transmission, to the drive shaft, to the differential, and then to the wheels. This is the rear all wheel drive platform which also includes the addition of a transfer case and an extra drive shaft and an extra differential to power the front wheels as well as the back. This is the front all-wheel drive platform which also includes the addition of a transfer case and an extra drive shaft and an extra differential to power the back wheels as well as the front. Front or rear all-wheel drive platforms may be full-time or part-time all-wheel drive. Because of the added friction and rotational mass of the extra drivetrain component and powering an additional set of wheels, most all-wheel drive vehicles will lose at least one mile to the gallon. Piston Engine Configuration There are three general types of piston engine configurations. There's the horizontally opposed or flat engines, such as the F4 and F6. Inline engines, such as the I3, I4, I5, and I6. V engines, such as the V6, V8, V10, and V12. The only exception to these engine designs is Audi and Volkswagen that manufactures their engines with a much more narrow cylinder angle such as the VR6 which is nearly a cross between an inline engine and V engine, the W8, W12 and W16 Bugatti engine. Piston Engine Operation this is the operation of a four-cycle internal combustion engine with a dual overhead cam design. As the crankshaft spins, it uses timing pulleys and belts to revolve the camshafts so the valves are in sync with the motion of the pistons. As the camshaft revolves, the cam lobes open the intake and exhaust valves to allow air-fuel mixture into the cylinders and to expel the spent exhaust gases. The valve springs rapidly close the valves to tightly seal the combustion chamber in order to achieve a proper combustion pressure. The timing belt also has markings to accurately position the camshafts for a precise valve activation which is crucial otherwise the engine would fail to function. You can see the four cycles occurring. Intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. 
the up and down motion of the piston is converted into a circular motion via the connecting rod and crankshaft. Every single rotation of the crankshaft equals one engine revolution. Do not confuse this with engine RPMs, which is how many crankshaft revolutions that occur per minute. And the Wanko rotary engine. The triangular shape of the rotor revolves around the trochoid shape of the engine housing. The rotor's apex creates a path that is similar to what you might see when using a spirograph. The path the rotor follows keeps the rotor's apex seals in constant contact with the engine's housing. This creates three separate chambers to begin the combustion process, which is similar to the combustion process of the piston engine. Intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. The only exception is the piston engine utilizes a myriad of moving parts. Intake and exhaust valves, springs, camshafts, timing pulleys and timing belts for engines with an overhead cam design, rocker arms, push rods, timing gears, and timing chains for engines with an overhead valve design, pistons, connecting rods, and a separate crankshaft as opposed to two or three rotors connected to an eccentrically mounted output shaft to provide power to the vehicle with fewer moving parts. There are advantages and disadvantages with both engine types. Transmission Gear Ratios Every vehicle is equipped with some type of transmission. The transmission increases or decreases the engine revolution speed in relation to the speed of the vehicle. Without a transmission, the engine would need to be directly connected to the differential which would make accelerating, decelerating, or maintaining vehicle speed difficult for the engine to accomplish. The three most common types of transmissions are the automatic transmission, the manual transmission, and the hybrid manumatic transmission which can be used in either fully automatic or semi-manual mode. The gear ratios of the transmission are determined by counting the number of gear teeth of the revolutions of the engine's input and dividing it by the number of gear teeth to the revolutions of the transmission's output. For example, a first gear ratio of 3 to 1 would require the smaller gear from the engine's input to have only 20 teeth, while the larger gear to the transmission's output would have 60 teeth. When the engine's input is 3,000 revolutions, the transmission's output is reduced to 1,000 revolutions, thereby multiplying the engine's power for ease of acceleration from a full stop or lower speeds. As the vehicle speed increases, less engine power is required, thereby using much taller gearing from the engine's input and shorter gearing to the transmission's output. As the engine input revolutions decrease, the transmission's output revolutions increase with every subsequent gear change. If you were to look at the gear ratios of a GM Tremec 6-speed manual transmission, it will look something like this. First gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, and sixth gear. Since first gear has a ratio of 2.66 to 1, there will be 266 input revolutions from the engine versus 100 output revolutions of the transmission. A 1.78 to 1 ratio, 178 revolutions versus 100. A 1.30 to 1 ratio, 130 revolutions versus 100. This is the 1 to 1 ratio, which means the engine and transmission will revolve at the same speed. A 0.78 to 1 ratio, 78 revolutions versus 100. This is a 0.50 to 1 ratio, which is also known as double overdrive, which means the engine's input revolutions will now spin 50% slower than the output revolutions of the transmission. Differential Gear Ratios The differential 
aka axle ratio or final drive gear is used once again to reduce the revolutions to the wheels from the transmission thereby multiplying the engine's power even further to transmit even more horsepower and torque to the wheels for the ease of accelerating, decelerating or maintaining vehicle speed. The differential just like the transmission gear ratios are determined by counting the number of teeth of the much larger ring gear versus the number of teeth of the much smaller pinion gear which is thusly connected to the transmission via a drive shaft or transaxle. This axle ratio has 41 teeth on the ring gear and 10 teeth on the pinion gear which would make this a 4.10 to 1 ratio. While the transmission and pinion gear will execute 410 revolutions, the revolution output of the ring gear will only be 100. If this were a 3.73 to 1 ratio, 373 revolutions versus 100. A 3.23 to 1 ratio, 323 revolutions versus 100. A 2.73 to 1 ratio, and so on. The gear ratio of the differential never changes unless the gears are physically swapped out for different gears. That also loosely translates into the vehicle's tires matching the revolutions of the ring gear in relation to the revolutions of the transmission. If the differential has a 4.10 to 1 ratio, there will be 410 transmission input revolutions versus 100 output revolutions of the vehicle's tires. A 3.73 to 1 ratio, 373 revolutions versus 100. A 3.23 to 1 ratio, 323 revolutions versus 100. A 2.73 to 1 ratio, and so on. The revolution of the transmission's input is always dictated by the differential ratio regardless of the tire diameter. Different Tire Diameters Tires come in a large variety of widths and diameters. Although tire size can technically be thought of as a form of gearing, tires will not have an effect on the gear ratios of the transmission nor will it alter the revolutions of the transmission's output. They will, however, have an effect on engine RPMs. As larger tires can cover a greater distance per revolution, the smaller tires will need more revolutions to cover the same distance. While the larger tire will cause a decrease in engine RPMs and an increase in mileage, the smaller tire will cause an increase in engine RPMs and a decrease in mileage. Installing larger tires would be the equivalent of installing a lower differential gear, whereas smaller tires would be the equivalent of installing a differential of a higher ratio. The greater the difference in tire sizes, the more pronounced the engine RPMs and fuel consumption will become. To get a better understanding of what happens to engines that use higher gearing as a cheaper method of better performance, let's see what happens to the cyclist as he shifts into lower gears while maintaining a speed of 15 miles per hour. In 10th gear, he would pedal like this. In 7th gear, he would pedal like this. In 5th gear, he would pedal like this. In 3rd gear, you would pedal like this. However, to maintain a speed of 15 miles per hour in first gear, he would need to pedal like this. Numerically higher gears are physically smaller and thus will require the cyclist to pedal at a faster pace with every single gear change. To continue pedaling at this pace would cause a person to burn up all of their energy at an exponential rate. The same exact thing happens to vehicles with engines that produce less torque that use a combination 
of increased horsepower and higher gearing as a cheaper method of performance. The numerically higher, physically smaller gears increases the engine's RPMs, which induces higher amounts of friction onto the engine's moving parts as well as the transmission and drivetrain components. The engine will also experience higher pumping losses due to the higher RPMs as well as producing higher levels of tailpipe emissions. Other factors that can affect mileage are design of the engine, design of the transmission, design of the vehicle, vehicle speed, driving habits, inclinations or declinations in the road, road conditions, traffic, wind resistance, weather, and temperature. However, the biggest culprit for heavy fuel consumption seems to point to the combination of increasing engine horsepower and using higher gearing as a cheaper alternative for improving vehicle performance. Let's take a quick look at a 2004 Chevrolet Corvette, a 2004 Hyundai Tiburon, and a 2004 Mazda RX-8. If these three vehicles sat at an intersection with the engines idling, the vehicle to burn the most fuel would be the Chevrolet Corvette, then the Hyundai Tiburon, and then the Mazda RX-8. That is the perfect example of the fuel efficiency of the engine in and of itself. However, let's take a closer look and see what happens to these vehicles engines as the transmissions shift to their gears.
as you can see, you can have both better mileage and better performance, provided that you use a larger engine that provides more torque using lower gearing than you can with using a smaller engine that has less torque when you use higher gearing. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that every single vehicle on the road needs a large V8 under the hood, but the automotive industry needs to stop screwing around with the downsized engines with high gearing and focus on building larger engines that provide more torque and power and use lower gearing for better performance. Instead of a strung out six cylinder, use a V8. Instead of a high revving four cylinder, use a six cylinder. Instead of a puny, man screaming wonkle engine, Use a V8, or God forbid, actually get the automotive industry to get off their lazy butts and physically build a larger Wankel engine that can provide better torque and power and use lower gearing for better performance. Using higher gearing in these downsized engines as a cheaper performance alternative actually wound up doing less for performance and more to cause these smaller engines to burn more fuel which not only fed the fire for the so-called issue of supply and demand for gasoline and diesel fuel, it also defeated the purpose of downsizing these engines for improvements in mileage and emissions to begin with. And where was the automobile industry going with this? What was their game plan? What were they trying to gain? What were they hoping to achieve by making these smaller engines burn more fuel? Was it merely cheaper for them to slap in higher gearing to make these smaller engines perform better? Or was this a shameless plan designed for us to shell out more money to the gas stations, to the oil companies, to Wall Street, and the government for more fuel taxes? Or was this also a shameless plan designed to give the EPA something to bitch and cry about over fuel economy, tailpipe emissions, global warming, carbon taxes, peak oil, and the never-ending issue of the overuse of foreign oil? I mean, is this just a weird coincidence, or is there some kind of collusion going on? And speaking of emissions, I think it's just mildly ironic that the EPA would actually bitch and complain more about the big trucks, the big cars, and the big engine vehicles for burning way too much fuel and creating way too many levels of tailpipe emissions, when clearly there are many other smaller engine vehicles on the road that were just as bad and even worse than the big vehicles. Yet those vehicles hardly ever got a second look. Why? That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. If the trend for so many years was to take engines that are originally downsized for improvements in mileage and emissions only later on to ramp them up with higher gearing as a cheaper performance alternative, causing these smaller engines to burn way more fuel and create way higher levels of tailpipe emissions, then how in the world was the automotive industry ever supposed to deliver the large fleet of ultra-low emission vehicles that we've been promised for so long? 